of the elders, wherein they might be more perfectly instructed in the great things of God during the coming winter. A building for the a printing office was nearly finished, and the lower story of the building was set apart for that purpose, the school, which or when it was completed. So the Lord opened the way according to the faith and works, and blessed be his name. RLDS History 1, 524 to 1 to 525. Hold on there for a second. Okay. Okay, okay so uh, we see, you know, this is uh, October of 1834, and he makes mention there that uh, uh, on that the third or fourth line there on the page 113, be more perfectly instructed in the great things of God during the coming winter. And you'll see, if you go back and read the history uh, of this and, and church history, that a lot of these classes, a lot of these, these things that they would do were um, more prevalent, more focused during the winter months. Because uh, a lot of people, you know, people were, we, we didn't run down to whatever this is, sunrise down here and buy our fruits and vegetables and stuff, you know, uh, and, and our meats and things, you know, in 1834. They, they had to raise them themselves, so there was a lot of work there. And then some of them acted, you know, uh, ran farms or whatever other businesses. There was a very heavy summer, summer spring, summer fall work uh, load that they had. So the winter was the time they freed up. And you'll see, if you go back and read some of the histories that, that these, I, I think during the year they would hold different classes and different different things, but it was more uh, prevalent and focused, uh, a greater emphasis put on it during the winter months when they had more time to, to actually do these things, okay? So I just wanted to point that out. And then, uh, so they, and then they were, of course, building the printing office there in Kirtland and, uh, and, and then uh, working on the, uh, the temple also. So you wanna keep going, Karen? Okay. okay. Later in November, Joseph wrote in his record, I continued my labors daily. Prepared. I think you skipped a paragraph there. Did I? Yeah. Oh, the prophet. Okay. That's okay. I, I started reading to that. I was like, wait a minute. I don't remember she wrote that. Yeah. Okay. I'll start over. That's okay. The prophet's journal for November of 1834 continues. No month ever found me more busily engaged than November. But as my life consisted of activity and unyielding exertions, I made this my rule. When the Lord commands to do it, Millennial Star 15, 183 to 184. All right, go ahead and stop there for a second. So I just want to point out that phrase that he used, when the Lord commands, do it. Okay, that, that's a good, good, you know, outside of this whole lectures and everything else, that is a, a very good motto, I think, or mission or whatever you want to call it for, your, for each and every one of us. When, when the Lord impresses something on your heart, do it then. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't argue with him. It's easy to do, especially if you don't want to do it. But, you know, do it because that's his will. All right. Okay. Go ahead, Karen. Okay. RLDS History 1, 525. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you during the, the references there. I thought that, you that's got through them. That's okay. okay go ahead. <laughs> Later in November, Joseph wrote in his record, I continued my labors daily, preparing for the school. On December 1st, 1834, Joseph wrote, our school for the elders was now well attended and with lectures on theology, which were regularly delivered, italics added, absorbed um, for the time being, everything else is of, I'm sorry, everything else of a temporal nature. The classes being mostly elders gave the most studious attention to the all important, on, I've got to turn a page here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> object of qualifying themselves as messengers of Jesus Christ to be ready to do his will in carrying glad tidings to all that would open their eyes, ears, and hearts. Millennial Star 15203-204, RLDS History 1530. Okay, go ahead and hold there for a second. Okay. So you see a number of times here in Joseph's record, he has referred to this as the uh, School of the Elders. Uh, or school for the elders, and then, and then you know he did there in that paragraph, but a little later on, the classes being mostly elders. So just because they were calling it school for the elders is is a is a term doesn't mean it was for Melchizedek priesthood only. Okay, I don't think they had the high priest quite yet, uh, historically wise, but it wasn't just for the elders only. This was a class open to all priesthood. And that's why it's called the School of the Prophets or another name. If you go back earlier in this pamphlet, you'll see it was called the School of the Apostles also. It's just a different number of different things. Um, and then the lectures on faith, you'll see it's, they also term it lectures on theology. 
So there's a couple different different things. So when you start seeing these terms, when you're reading through uh, various accounts and church history, story of our church, you know, things like that, um, just remember what they're referring to. In school of the elders, school of the apostles, are referring to the school of the prophets, lectures on faith, lectures on theology, and I don't remember if they called it anything else, but those are all referring to, you know, these lectures on faith here. Okay, go ahead and keep going. Okay, the fact that Joseph was so extremely busy in preparing for the school is an evidence that he was the person who was writing the lectures on faith, which were undoubtedly the most important study course in the school. While there is no absolute proof, it is, a reasonab it is reasonable to assume from these two entries in Joseph's journal that he wrote the lectures on faith in late October and November, or had a major part in helping to write them and that he probably was a teacher, or at least one of the teachers, who presented them to the elders in the School of the Prophets. All right. Anybody have any questions or comments on that section there? Okay. Okay. Uh, you feel like keep going, or I you want to give it up? One. Okay. The first publication of the Lectures on Faith. Joseph not only was diligent in writing the lectures and having them taught at, in the School of the Prophets, but he also supervised the publication of them. He occupied the primary position in the publication process because he was the first of four men who were appointed to serve on a publication committee for a new book of scripture which was to be prepared, the Doctrine and Covenants. See the original preface on page um, 13, 13 yeah. in this edition. It should be remembered that in July of 1833, the Jackson County mob had destroyed the press while in the Book of Commandments was being printed. Therefore, the High Council of the Church at Kirtland voted on September 24, 1834 to have the new book prepared. History records in, in this council, El Elders Joseph Smith, Jr., Oliver Cowdery, Sidney Rignan, and F.G. Williams were appointed a committee to arrange the items of the doctrine of Jesus Christ for the government of the church with the provision that these items are to be taken from the Bible, Book of Mormon, and the revelations which have been given unto the church up to this date, or shall be until the arrangements are made. RLDS History 1, 523. The prophet took seriously his part in preparing the book, his journal records. During the month of January 1835, I was engaged in the School of Elders and in preparing the lectures on theology for publication in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, italics added, which the committee, which the committee appointed last September were now compiling RLDS History 1, 539. Okay, go ahead and stop there for a second. Okay, so, you know, that bit, that blurb, the paragraph before what she just read, you know, uh, was a council meeting in which they appointed a committee to, to put together the Doctrine and Covenants. Okay, uh, remember the Book of Commandments was never finished and actually uh, in, the, in the, uh, the printed sheets actually stopped in the middle of a sentence. So um, any claims that the Book of Commandments is the correct book and, and so on and so forth are false and the church never approved it for use. Uh, in 1835, a little further on than where we are right here in this history, uh, was when the, the book was, was finally published and approved. Well, it was approved first and then published uh, for, you know, for publication. The, the uh, lectures on faith were the first part, and I'm sure it'll go on and talk about this, but they were the first part of that Doctrine and Covenants, and um, so that was the doctrine part of the Doctrine and Covenants, the title. And so sometimes in church history, you'll see people refer to the Book of Covenants. That's not the Book of Commandments. They're referring to the, the, the uh, uh, Revelation portion of the Doctrine and Covenants when they say Book of Covenants. You'll see Joseph III refers to it a number of times in his writings. The, in the Doctrine and Covenants, it was printed, first printed in 1835, as I said, and included the lectures on faith, and in, in every subsequent printing up until 1897, uh, included that, that lectures on faith. For some reason, the church decided in 1897 to remove the lectures on faith. Um, and the best I can figure uh, was, uh, there, there was just a, it's kind of a decision out of nowhere. There, there's no reasoning given. I've gone down and looked through the church archives and things trying to find it in the past. And, and it basically is just a resolution passed by the, um, uh, the Quorum of Twelve to remove the, the, lectures, or not, yeah, the lectures on faith out of the Doctrine and Covenants. But there's no reasoning given. 
anywhere. I'm sure in the debates there probably were, but you know, back then they didn't take really good notes sometimes in their, in their, uh, in their discussions. I shouldn't say debates, their discussions on those things. But if you have a price publishing doctrine and covenants, um, they will have the lectures on faith in the front and they've, they've added those back in. Okay. So, um, when we get to the actual lectures, if you have one of those, bring it with you, uh, or bring the black book. I mean, it's the same, same stuff. Um, cause at that point I'm probably not going to keep you running these. I just know that the doctrine and covenants, uh, the prices published did not have this story, uh, of the, the lectures in it. All right. Any questions, comments so far? We good? All right. Keep okay. going. In May of 1835, Elder Oliver Calgary reported the committee was making progress with the printing. He wrote, the following are two short lectures which were delivered before a the theological class in this place last winter. Italics added, these lectures are being compiled and arranged with other documents of instruction and regulation for the church titled Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of Latter-day Saints and I guess that's Doctrine and Covenants and Covenants uh, or? Etc. Oh, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, it's just an abbreviation oh. for et cetera. Oh. Okay. I don't know why they do that. Uh, okay. Ampersand C means et cetera. I don't okay. know why. So. I've never seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> it may be well for the information of the churches abroad to say that this book will contain the important revelations on doctrine and church government now extinct and will, we trust, give them a perfect understanding of the doctrine believed by the society. Such a work has long been called for, and if we are proposed a few, a few weeks, shall have this volume ready for dis distribution. A, fail, a full detail of its contents will be given hereafter. Latter-day Saints Messenger at, and Advocate, Kirtland, Ohio, May 1835, 1, 122. At last, the Doctrine and Covenants was completed and the General Assembly of August 17, 1835 at Kirtland. It was approved as the Doctrine and Covenants of their faith. Doctrine and Covenants, 1952 edition, 108A12. This event was important because the lectures co constituted the first part of that book. This action caused the lectures on faith to be accepted as scripture. Some of the action recorded concerning this general assembly included afternoon. After a hymn was sung, President Caldry arose and introduced the Book of Doctrine and Covenants of the Church and the Latter-day Saints in behalf of the committee. He was followed by President Rigdon, who explained the manner by which they intended to obtain the voice of the assembly for, for or against said book. The other two committee uh, members Joseph Smith and F. G. Williams, named above, were absent. R. L. Were absent. R. L. D. S. History one five seven three. Elder John Smith, taking the lead of the High Council in Kirtland, bore record that the revelations in said book were true, and that the lectures were judicially. <laughs> If I get that out, judiciously arranged and compiled, and were profitable for doctrine. Italic italics added whereupon the high council of kirtland accepted and acknowledged them as a doctrine and covenants of their faith by unanimous vote rlds history 1573 to 1574 all right go ahead and hold there for a okay. second uh, i like um, oliver cowdery's uh, description in that first paragraph on page 116 the first portion of the paragraph and he talks about the, the Doctrine and Covenants in general, but the important revelations on doctrine and church government now extend, and will, we trust, give them a perfect understanding of the doctrine believed by this society. Okay? So, so the, the, the doctrine uh, of, of this church can, can be understood by the Doctrine and Covenants with the lectures on faith contained in it. Okay? The lectures on faith are a very, very important um, aspect of our of our doctrine of our understanding of the scriptures because they bring out so many fine points uh, one being the number of personages in the Godhead was that lecture five Dave lecture five in there and uh, I have a hard time remembering which one goes into each lecture sometimes but uh, you know uh, and you know the many many denominations teach that there's three personages in the Godhead there are many that teach there's one personage personage 
excuse me, in the Godhead, but we know from the, the lectures on faith, there are two personages plus the Holy Ghost, which is the mind and will of God, and the Spirit of God in there. And we'll go through that, we'll go through all this. If that's a new concept to you, then good, because we'll go through it and we'll, we'll get an understanding of those things. Uh, but by the, by the church taking those, those lectures out of the Doctrine and Covenants when they did in 1897, um, that, that one point in particular about the, the number of personages, whether Trinity, single, or, or I don't know what you'd call what, what it really is, um, the duality plus spirit, I don't know. But uh, that has been lost in many of our own church members and, and many of our priesthood. And, uh, you know, there was... Uh, uh, Someone who put out a, a their own version of the Book of Mormon a few years back, who whose whole purpose was to concentrate on going with the one one idea of one person in the Godhead uh, ideal and and try to go that route. And then there's others who claim there's uh, three people in the Trinity. In fact, uh, one of one of the hymns that we have in the Tan Hymnal, actually, and I can't remember which one, Dave. Can you maybe help me out on that one. Is it nine? Okay. Actually, is theologically incorrect. Holy, holy, holy. holy, holy that's okay, in the Tan Hymnal, and uh, you know, the last line there is God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Okay, um, in the Blue Hymnal, it's different. I don't remember exactly what it says. Anybody remember? Uh, you remember which number that is? Sorry. Forty-four. Four four zero. Okay. What's that? Yeah, and that's um, wait a minute. That's a different line there. Sorry, I knew where I was going with this. Let me let me check this out. Uh, da, 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 mighty. So the last line in the blue hymnal states, "Or all victorious, all all in all to me," versus "God in three persons, blessed Trinity." Okay, so there's a, there's a huge difference there. And the blue one would be theologically correct, doctrinally correct. This one is not. Okay, so I'm going to flat out say this. There's obviously been some contention in the Odessa branch at some point over the doctrine of the number of personages in the, in the, in the Godhead. Okay, um, I think that's a fair statement to say. And it may be a little contentious, and I apologize for that, but it's there. Steve? Hold on, Steve. Sorry. We want to get this on tape because it's important. That comes up every few years. Absolutely. Uh, and it's again and again and again. We had the same problem at Kingsville uh, mm -hmm. just a couple of years ago. Uh, we had one elder who was real big on the one Godhead. Yep. And, you know, it just it, it's just something that you have to study for yourself. Uh, and... and you know, and, and follow the scriptures. If you read the scriptures, you know, you know. Right. And that's why this is so important in our church, in our doctrine, in our understanding. Okay? Because it brings out many of those finer points that are, that are there in the scriptures, but it pulls them together. Okay? So that's, that's why we need to look at this, these every few years, I think, at least every few years, if not. But, you know, a lot of these, we should be teaching these from the pulpit in uh, home ministry and in all these things. So, and that's, that's a push that we're trying to make in our home ministry is to start doing more teaching and, and a little less uh, social visiting. We like the social visiting, don't get me wrong, but we want to do a little more teaching when we're in the homes also. So, anyway, going with that, um, that's basically all I had to say there. Uh, anybody anybody else okay we'll go back to Karen I hope she remembers where we were because I oh I don't remember now yeah we're over the there in the testimony or at the same meeting yeah okay. at the same meeting the written testimony of the 12 apostles was read by President W W Phelps the testimony of the witnesses to the book of the Lord's Commandments, which he gave to his church through Joseph Smith, Jr., who was appointed by the voice of the church for this purpose. We therefore feel willing to bear testimony to all the world of mankind, to every creature upon the face of all the earth and upon the islands of the sea, that the Lord has borne record to our souls through the Holy Ghost shed forth upon us. 
that these commandments were given by inspiration of God and are profitable for all men and are verily true. We give this testimony unto the world, the Lord being our helper, and it is through the grace of God, the Father, and his Son, Jesus Christ, that we are permitted to have this privilege of bearing this testimony unto the world, in which we rejoice exceeding, praying the Lord always that the children of men may be profited. Therefore, RLDS History 1574. Each of the priesthood quorums was represented by a man who bore record of the truth of the book. All quorums voted unanimously to accept the new book of the Doctrine and Covenants, which included the lectures on faith. The whole congregation accepted and acknowledged it as the Doctrine and Covenants of their faith by unanimous vote. RLDS History 1, 575. In this manner, the Book of Doctrine and Covenants became scripture, both the doctrine part of it, the lectures, and the covenants part of it, the revelations. This action has never been rescinded. Therefore, the lectures on faith should still be considered scripture. All right, go ahead and stop there. Um, I know a lot of people don't consider these to be scripture um, because they're not, they may not be labeled as direct revelation from God. Um, Although if you look through the Bible and you look through the Book of Mormon, you read a lot of that's history. And it's not direct revelation from God uh, as in a thus saith the Lord type thing. So I've always, this is me personally, I've always looked at these since I found out this as, as scripture because it is profitable for us. And uh, it is something that we, that we need to be studying. And uh, for the priesthood especially, during during the, the schools, the school of the prophets, it was... Not just suggested, but but really, really emphasized and pushed that the priesthood should memorize these, so that they would have them at the drop of a hat if they needed uh, something on that. I have not obviously done that, <laughs> but um, you know, it is something that that we at least should be studying consistently and diligently along with our with the other other scriptures that we have. Okay, um, anybody, Chris. I was just going to say, it, I wouldn't know 100% where to put the uh, lectures of faith, whether it be scripture or a good book. You know, I, I think I'm with you on that. The, just hold it up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sound just like uh, Colin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, I, I personally hold it up as scripture, like you said. There, what, what reason would we have to not consider it scripture when there was no reason to take it out initially? But at the very least, I think we could... Uh, lay it under the category of um, reading all good books, like when we read through the scriptures, when we read um, Paul saying something by permission. He says, I've been com been given permission by the Lord to say this. Is that direct mm -hmm. revelation from God? Well, no, but it's, it's, there's a lot of wisdom in those things that we read, and there's the reason I think that the Lord allowed those things to be in the scripture, or when Joseph Smith, or Joseph the Third rather, um, says by permission, goes into... Um, more detail about uh, priesthood duties, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Is that scripture? Well, no, technically not, but there's a lot of wisdom in those words he sure. says. And I, I think it's, um, like I said, I don't know if it falls on the category, but they, at the very least, I'd say it'd be under that category. Absolutely. And I, and I don't mean to, to, mean, to stay, say or come across as just because it's not a thus saith the Lord doesn't mean it's not scripture. I don't, I don't mean that at all, because that was my point with, with the Bible and the Book of Mormon and things in there, is you'll see a lot of that that's just recorded history, but yet we'll point that out and, and say, yes, it, it is scripture uh, because it's contained uh, in those things. Now, there's somewhere in the Doctrine and Covenants that, that actually states that uh, when, when a priesthood member is preaching from the pulpit, and yeah, I don't know that it states this, but it's an assumption that when those things that he is saying are in line with the scriptures, that that would be scripture unto us also. Okay? So anything that is in line with the scripture, I guess, can be considered. Um, whether scripture or close to scripture, pseudo scripture, whatever you want to call it, but something that is, is very, very profitable for us. Does that make sense? Okay. But, uh, and I can't overemphasize this. If you don't have copies of this, get one and study it along with the other three books. Okay. Um, anyone else before we move on? Greg? All right, we'll turn this thing on here. Um, if you look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
verse 16, it says, And all scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. And if you notice, it says, And all scripture given by inspiration of God. And I think, I mean, whenever I've always read this, I've always understood it to be exactly what, what you're saying. I'm just scripturally backing up what you're saying right. here. I appreciate that. Thank that, you. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that if it's inspired of God, if, if there's a testimony behind the wisdom and it's been accepted by not, not just one or two, but by three or more witnesses uh, or, or a congregation, you know, uh, and, and witness, therefore, I mean, at that point, it, it literally becomes a, a, the scriptures in, in which we're lived by, you know, to mean in, in, in spot, in, anything inspired by God. And so it didn't say anything uh, spoken by the word, you know, out, out mm -hmm. of the mouth of God, even though we are supposed to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. But nonetheless, it specifically just said in, in, by inspiration of God. So, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit and prompted. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it, obviously, at this point, scripturally speaking, you can prove with, with all three books that, yeah, this is, this is scripture. Okay, absolutely. Now, um, remember exactly what, what Greg was saying. I almost called you Chris again, sorry. <laughs> yeah, he and his brother, I don't know why I want to call him Chris all the time, but, the but uh, one, it's inspiration from, <laughs> gee, for good looking, I know. But, uh, uh, but it's uh, uh, inspiration of God, and it has to go along with the scriptures, because you can get a th group of three or more people to agree on just about anything. You know, and then they can call it their scriptures. And we've just had that recently with the Brazil plates and, you know, some of these other things that have been coming out. But it has to be in line, all the way in line with, with the other scriptures that are previously given. What? As long as it is the truth. Yes. Yeah, the truth is given, given in the previous revelation uh, from God. And it, it can't be disjunctive, right? Okay, because we've lived through a lot of that, too. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, Elver? I don't know, but all, through the years, we have uh, went through quite a bit of this that I, I even forgot, you know, I forgot about. But uh, this, this one uh, here where it says uh, it is inspired by God. Mm -hmm. If there's a reason that we don't understand, and there's a lot of stuff probably we don't understand. Sure. But if we don't, we need to do a lot of praying about it. Yeah. We need to, I mean, we need to get serious about it, go, go in our secret places. And I mean, even, even out on the job, if you're doing something, working, you can still have prayers on your mind and in your heart. Mm -hmm. And pray about this because it says it's inspired by God. I don't know uh, how much better uh, words that you could put to make it more truthful, really. Yeah, and that's in my opinion. Absolutely. No, I, yeah. I and and not only do I agree with your opinion, James one five backs up that opinion. Everybody else should know what James one five basically says: <laughs> that if you have questions, go and ask God, yep. and He's not going to chastise you. Go ask him, and he'll he'll provide that answer as long and as you listen, ask in full listen faith. For, listen for the answer, and that's what he answered exactly. And you know, if you're sure about the answers on faith, go ask, go ask him. Absolutely, he'll confirm it. I have no doubt. He has for me, but you know, it's just me. And yeah, I, I think a number of people in here have had that confirmed. Okay, so no, that's a great point. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, let's go ahead and continue on. Karen, you've done a good job. I appreciate it. I'm going to give you a break. Anybody else would like to read? Uh, go ahead, Denise. That'd be great. Stop. 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 Uh, uh, the lectures were well, well written. They're on yeah. 118. The lectures were well written. Mm -hmm. It is. I think so. Yeah, so I was thinking something was happening there. I don't know what. Two double A's. Hey, two double A's, Chris. Go ahead. Yeah, you're, when you're ready, Denise. Uh, the lectures were well written. It is evident that the lectures were written with precise care. Careful readers appreciate the profuse use of the scriptures which is found in them, and the author's in-depth comprehension of the Word of God, which is so evident and so characteristic of the writings of early church officials. Each line of reasoning is fully supported in the lectures with appropriate scriptures. 
The lectures are organized methodically to give instruction about the faith necessary to enable the saints to obtain celestial life. The first lecture states that faith claims the first place in a course of lectures which are designed to unfold to the understanding of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. In a methodical manner, each lecture is built on the one previously presented. The first five lectures are divided into two parts, a formal persuasive discourse or argument, followed by a catechism of questions and answers. It was found that by annexing a catechism to the lectures as they were presented, the class made greater progress than otherwise, and in consequence of the additional proofs, it was preserved in compiling. Latter-day Saints, Messenger and Advocate, Kirtland, Ohio, May 1st, 1835, page 122. All right, I'm going to stop there. So, uh, as, as you go through and you look in, in your books there, thank you, Chris, appreciate it. Uh, if you look in your books there, um, you'll see that these, they go, the lectures go through, and each, each thought is backed up by Scripture, but especially when you get to the catechism, and I know catechism is a word normally associated with cat Catholicism, but, but it's, a catechism is basically a study. It's a study, okay? But you get back to there, and they'll have a question and answer section in the back of the first five lectures, I think is what she stated, and it'll go through the points in the lecture and back them up with Scripture, okay? So that's what we're going to see as we go through and study these, all right? If you want to keep going. The lectures deleted from the Doctrine and Covenants. The lectures on faith were printed in the 1835 edition and all succeeding editions through the 1894 edition. In 1897, a revised edition of the Doctrine and Covenants was issued by the Board of Publication of the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In this edition, the lectures were deleted, and since that date, they have not been included in any edition. An announcement of the publication of the 1897 edition was made in the Saints Herald on August 25th of that year. It included a notice which read, The lectures on faith are omitted, but may be published later in pamphlet form, or for those who may want them. Journal of History, April 1921, page 154. That works. Okay, and that is about the most, uh, uh, the, the best description, the most descriptive uh, item you will find as to why these were taken out. Okay, and if you go back and look at the Saints Herald, if you go back and look at the, the conference minutes and, and all those things, I've done that. And this, this is it. So, again, I'm sure in the, the discussions there were more reasoning given, but, but this is it for what we'll find. Okay. F. Henry Edwards, who for so many years was a member of the RLDS First Presidency, commented on this, this subject in 1977. He said, the reason for this omission seems to be fairly clear. Some, and possibly all, of the lectures were delivered by Joseph Smith, and they were prepared for publication by him, so that it appears they received his approval or endorsement. But they were not held to be on the same level as the Revelations. As John Smith said in the General Assembly at which the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants was approved, the lectures were judiciously arranged and compiled and were profitable for Doctrine DNC 108A 4D. And their major value today is historical, italics added. It seems strange that a modern writer would write that the major value of the lectures is only historical, while the church leaders in 1835, who approved of the original Doctrine and Covenants, found the lectures to be profitable for doctrine. The historical value concept is even more improper when it is understood that Joseph Smith considered the lectures so spiritually important that he placed them first in the Doctrine and Covenants. All right. So, um, yeah, that's... You can see even, you know, the, the changes in the church began much earlier than uh, the 60s, than the 50s and the 40s, even, uh, you know, earlier than Fred M. Some of the theological changes, the doctrinal changes in the church started much, much earlier. And, uh, you know, for F. Henry Edwards, who's a very respected uh, minister in the church, uh, to make this statement, I, I don't know, I don't know what, why he would make that statement. Uh, other than he didn't consider it, um, you know, to be a profitable uh, item in in the church for whatever reason, but we we know better, don't we? As I've stated, they are there to pull in that doctrine. You know, I, I guess I've always looked at the scriptures as kind of a, a puzzle, not not as in a uh, oh it's strange and you know it's puzzling, but but a puzzle in that when you're studying a subject, you've got to pick and pull and grab and find the different scriptures and put them all in. I think Dave likes to say you have to put all the scriptures in a hat and then take them out and see how they fit in together. And that's absolutely accurate. 
because all those scriptures have to back each other up in order for the truth to, to be true, you know, for the item to be true. If you find one scripture that doesn't back up your theory, then basically that's it. You've got to throw that theory out and start over. But the lectures on faith help bring all those, those puzzle pieces together for the, certain, for the different um, areas in which uh, we're studying you know, in those seven lectures. Okay. Questions or comments on this section? All right, let's continue on. The authorship. The authorship of the lectures on faith. Though it is apparent that the prophet Joseph Smith was the person most closely connected with writing the lectures, there is a possibility that one or more of other church officials may have assisted in the process. The Mormon scholar Leland Gentry has written that careful searches through letter, <coughs> excuse me, letter books and other papers of Joseph Smith and early church leaders, as well as scrutiny of numerous diaries, journals, and autobiographies for the 1834-1835 period have revealed nothing of a definite nature concerning the identity of either the writer or the deliverer of the lectures. At least three computer studies have been made on the lectures in an effort to prove who the author or authors were by comparing word prints and the text with the writings of churchmen of that day. These studies were made by Alan J. Phipps, Eleanor H. Partridge, and Larson Rencher and Layton. These computer studies differ in their analysis of who wrote the lectures, so they cannot be used as a definite proof of authorship. The above information shows that neither the record of history nor the computer analysis reveals who the author or authors were. By judging from the entries in Joseph's journal, as quoted above, he authored most of the writing, if not all of it. The Holy Ghost attends those who study the lectures on faith. They carry the same spirit as the three books of Scripture. They testify of God's hand being in the restored gospel message. They are indeed profitable for doctrine in every generation and worthy of being the doctrine portion of the Doctrine and Covenants as the Prophet Joseph originally intended. All right. Thank you very much, ladies. Denise, Karen, thanks for doing all that reading. Um, you know, the authorship, yeah, it'd be neat to know, but honestly, that, that is literally one of those things that doesn't matter so long as the, the lecturers truly do what they, they claim to do, and that is to teach the doctrine of the church and uphold the doctrine of the church. Um, you know, Joseph worked hand-in-hand -hand with, a, with a lot of people uh, at that time period, with Oliver Cowdery, Sidney Rigdon, uh, a number of other people. So I'm, I'm sure, you know, in my mind anyway, I'm, I'm fairly certain that Joseph had a huge hand in, in the writing of it, in the, the authorship of it. But I'm sure that Sidney Rigdon had some input. I'm sure Oliver had some input, and some of these other, F.G. Williams, some of the other leading men of the church, too. You know, I'd, and I don't have any issues with that, personally. You know, to me, it, it doesn't really matter, so long as... What's in there is backed up by the, the previously given scriptures, uh, you know, revelations, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the other revelations that Joseph received, and uh, uh, so long as, as it doesn't go against those, you know, that, that's what really matters. Okay. Uh, anyone? Anyone else? Okay. All right. Um, we only have about 10 minutes, and I really don't want to jump into uh, the first one here. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and read the, the, the preface. So if you have your copy, uh, if you got the black, black book or your Doctrine and Covenants uh, from Price Publishing, you can turn to, it's going to be page XV or 15 in Roman numerals. Okay, this is the preface to the original uh, Doctrine and Covenants. Um, and of course, that, that include the lectures on faith. And states to the members of the Church of Latter-day Saints, Dear brethren, we deem it to be unnecessary to entertain you with a lengthy preface to the following volume, but merely to say that it contains, in short, the leading items of the religion from which, I'm sorry, the religion uh, which we have professed to believe. The first part of the book will be found to contain a series of lectures as delivered before a theological class in this place. And in consequence of their embracing the important doctrine of salvation, we have arranged them into the following work. The second part contains items or principles for the regulation of the church, as taken from the revelations which have been given since its organization, as well as from former ones. Okay. Now, when it states that, it's referring to those revelations that were previously given to Enoch. Okay, the ones with the funny names. Okay. Those revelations, I can't remember, there's three or four of them, give or take, uh, those were originally given to Enoch. 
Okay, and that's why they have the different names. They're referring to actual men and places uh, in that time, but they were um, they they made sense. They 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 were um, I can't think of the word. Um, they fit into what was going on in the church in the latter days, which, of course, in my mind, shows us that we uh, that, that the history repeats itself. Number one, okay, and that the the uh, the path of God is 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 never ending. It's the same today, yesterday, and, and forever. All right. There may be an aversion in the minds of some against receiving anything purporting to be articles of religious faith in consequence of there being so many now extant. But if men believe a system and profess that it was given by inspiration, certainly the more intelligibly they can present it, the better. It does not make a principle untrue to print it, neither does it make it true not to print it. The church viewing the subject to be of importance uh, appointed through their servants and delegates the high council, your servants to select and compile this work. Several reasons might be adduced in favor of this move of the council, but we only add a few words. They knew that the church was evil spoken of in many places, its faith and belief misrepresented, and the way of truth thus subverted. By some, it was represented as disbelieving the Bible, by others as being an enemy to all good order and uprightness, and by others pardon me, as being injurious to the peace of all governments, civil and political. We have therefore endeavored to present, though in few words, our belief, and when we uh, say this, humbly trust, the faith and principles of this society as a body. We do not present this little volume with any other expectation than that we are to be called to answer to every principle advanced in that day when the secrets of our hearts will be revealed and the reward of every man's labor will be given him. With sentiments of esteem, sincere respect, we subscribe ourselves, your brethren, in the bonds of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, Joseph Smith, Jr., Oliver Cowdery, Sidney Rigdon, F.G. Williams. And that was dated Kirtland, Ohio, February 17, 1835. And that last paragraph, uh, you know, it, it, it speaks volumes here. We do not present this little volume with any other expectation that, than that we are to be called to answer to, our, to every principle advanced. Okay, in the day of judgment is what they're talking about. So what they present there is what they believed. And what they present there is what they believe they will stand before God and answer for. So that goes along with all the scriptures and everything that we profess to believe also. All right. So this is important. All right. Not just the lectures on faith, the church, the doctrine, all of it is very important. And if we profess to believe something, we better be doing it. And we better be, you know, showing that forth in this world and everything we do and say. All right. Anybody have any comments or questions? We're going to end just a little bit early, maybe, depending on comments and questions. Nobody? Okay, we are going to end a little early. Uh, Chris, would you offer a prayer to end us, please? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day that we could have, and I thank you for uh, blessing us that on this day that we could come together in your church and that we could worship you. And I just thank you so much for those freedoms that we can enjoy, that we can come to a church and that we can worship you freely and we don't uh, have to worry about our lives being taken for uh, such a thing. And I thank you uh, just for uh, guiding us and our forefathers to uh, build this country up to what it is. And, and I ask you to please uh, help us to preserve that, that we may do our diligent works as uh, individuals that we may uh, keep on going forward and uh, heal this land even uh, from the evils that are uh, plaguing it right now that we may go forth and be diligent to um, spread your word and to uh, do your will that we may uh, help uh, preserve this place and uh, make it holy and I ask you to please be with the uh, remainder of the service that you would uh, just flood this building with your spirit that you would be with the uh, the speakers today, that um, they would be blessed by you and what they say, and uh, that they would, would not rely on their own understanding, but they would rely on you. And I uh, ask you to please uh, just bless the services, that your will would be done, and that you would guide us through all that we do. I thank you so much for all the mercies that you give unto us, and I uh, thank you for all your blessings. And all these things I ask you in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Uh, does anyone who plans on being here for, for these...